In a world where success is measured by material possessions, there is a silent wealth killer lurking in your garage, disguised as a symbol of success. We have all dreamt of owning that head-turning car, which is not just a mode of transport, but proof to the world that you made it. At first, only the super rich could buy cars. They paid cash. By the 1910s, small business owners found cars great for moving stuff quickly but couldn't pay all at once, which gave birth to car financing. Fast forward to December 23, and car loan debt in the US hit $1.61 trillion. Yep, that's a trillion with a T. In this video, I am going to give you real strategies and tips based on my personal experience and tons of research to keep your money safe. But you have got to be really open to changing. And I mean genuinely ready to listen, learn, switch things up, and most importantly, act on what you learn from this video. But why is the media or news not talking about it? A lot of it comes down to perception, prestige, and the pursuit of happiness, or at least the illusion of it. The society has wired us to think of car ownership as a sign of moving up the ladder and success. Take a look for yourself. Magic is the feeling I had. It was absolute magic. It completed me. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to buy a car which makes me feel complete, but that's complete nonsense. US digital ad spend for the automotive industry is projected to grow 11.1% to $21.2 billion in 24 and about $2 billion in the UK. A lot of that money goes to the news and media outlets. So why would they bite the hand which feeds them? You might still be thinking, how can owning a car be a wealth killer? Could it be worse than gambling? First, not everyone gambles, but there are 860 vehicles per 1,000 people in the US and about 632 in the UK. Now I'm going to put my accountant's hat on and let's do some math together. The average cost of a new car in the US is about $48,000 or roughly 38,000 pounds in the UK. Considering the average depreciation of 80% after eight to 10 years, the car will be worth $9,600 at the end of 10 years. Now imagine if you bought a used car for 18K and invested the remaining $30,000 in the stock market. The S&P 500 has an average annual return of 10.86% over the last 32 years. If you invested $250 each month for the next 10 years, that 30K investment would grow to 51,000 US dollars. In both scenarios, you spend $48,000, but the outcomes are vastly different. Buying a new car leaves you with $10,000 after 10 years, while buying a used car and investing the difference leaves you with $51,000 in the pocket even assuming that the used car was scrapped for no value at all. Here's a surprising fact. 85% of people in the US and 80% in the UK buy new cars on loans. Now let's think about this. The average car costs $48,000. With a typical interest rate of 7.01% for a good credit history, you end up shelling out $59,000 for the same car. That includes a whopping $10,920 in interest payments. After eight years, that shiny new car is still worth $10,000. That hurts even just speaking about it. <laughs> Here's the kicker. That 11K interest, the banks call it profit. If we all bought cars in cash, banks would lose a significant portion of their earnings. Even more troubling, most financing deals penalize early payments, ensuring you stay in debt for long. Let that sink in for a while. And remember, interest rates can change, and we know how they have skyrocketed post-COVID. You could end up paying far more interest than you initially signed up for. My advice, stay clear of debt. Buying a new car comes with hidden cost that can catch you off guard. Dealers can slap a hefty markup in the US for new cars. For example, a new Toyota Corolla hybrid can have 21% added on top of the retail price for a new car. That's just bonkers. Luckily, this doesn't happen in the UK, but you'll still have to tackle other costs like registration fees that can soar up to $200. Plus, dealers tack on an admin fee for handling paperwork, which can run into hundreds of dollars. While you can't avoid government taxes, you can haggle with the dealer to get a discount on these fees. 
So before you drive headfirst into buying a new car, remember to factor in these hidden costs. Now I touched depreciation briefly earlier, but it's effectively the loss in value of a car over time, starting at about 20% the moment you drive it off the showroom. But you can play depreciation to your advantage. Back in 2016, I bought a BMW 3 Series, which cost me 13,000 pounds or about $16,000. The car was about four years old, still had two years of extended service warranty on it with just 33,000 miles. A similar spec new car would have costed me about 30,000 pounds. The seller had already taken a 57% loss in value and I got to enjoy a car worth 30,000 pounds at 57% discount. I have never had any trouble with the car and I still own it. You should do the same. Consider buying used you can get some pretty good deals on cars, which are generally three to four years old, which I found to be the sweet spot when the car is not too old, but you still get a really good value. Here's another interesting fact. Not all cars lose value in the same way. For example, a Ford F-Series truck only loses 34.48% at three year mark, but an Audi A3 in the UK loses 65% of its value in four years. If you are buying new, Consider cars with low depreciation, and if buying used, consider cars which have already lost more than 50 to 60% of their value, because that will reduce your future depreciation loss. Next, choosing the right fuel type for your car is a decision that can save you money in the long run. Here's an easy way to think about it. Picture the speed limit on a highway. It's typically around 70 miles per hour, both in the UK and the US. I mean, sure, you might be able to push a little above that, though I don't recommend it. But the fact is having a powerful sporty engine that guzzles fuel can't really be enjoyed unless there is a German Autobahn in every country. Technically, you have to drive within the legal limits. So there's no point getting a bigger engine. Now you have five main types of engines, petrol, diesel, hybrid, petrol, hybrid, electric vehicles or FEVs and EVs or electric vehicles. If you're mostly driving in the city for short distances, FEVs or EVs are the way to go. FEVs can run on electric power for those shorter city journeys, giving you great fuel efficiency. And when you need to hit the highway for longer trips, they switch over to the petrol engine. For those of you who are always on the road for longer commutes, diesel or hybrid vehicles could be your best bet. The bottom line is choose a car that suits your driving needs and gives you the best of fuel outcome and reduces your fuel cost during your cost lifetime ownership. When it comes to repair and maintenance, there are several strategies to keep the cost low. You can save on labor by doing simple tasks yourself, like replacing wiper blades, tires, and air filters. Avoid reckless driving, like doing donuts, to prevent unnecessary damage to your car. The last time I had to replace the brake pads on my car, I chose OEM or Original Equipment Manufacturer parts instead of buying them straight from BMW. These were nearly 30% cheaper and I didn't notice any difference. OEM parts are manufactured by the same company that produced the original parts for your vehicle. Car makers add their branding on top and sell them at a premium, but you can buy OEM parts directly at a significant discount. Lastly, don't forget to keep up with regular oil and filter changes to maintain your car's performance. Next, insurance. I have never come to term with why insurance is mandatory by law, but that's a separate story. You can significantly cut down your annual insurance bill which is on average 1,000 pounds in the UK and about $2,150 in the US. In general, more luxury cars or vehicles with frequent mechanical issues have higher insurance premiums. However, you can maneuver around these costs by various strategies. These include paying annually. This simple trick can shave off up to 15% from your insurance costs. Second, use comparison websites like Compare the Market or Uswitch to find the best deals. They do the hard work for you comparing multiple insurance providers at once. Third, hike your excess or deductibles. Increasing your insurance excess or deductible in the US from the standard, which is about 250 pounds in the UK, can reduce your premium by another 10 to 15%. It's a small risk for a sizable reward and I always increase my premium, which gets me a better deal. Next, maintain a clear, your driving history is a big deal for insurance companies. 
a clean record and a long history of no claims can significantly lower your premiums. My first year insurance was a whopping £2,500, but it's now just about $800, thanks to my no claim history, which I've built up preciously over these years. So what does the true ownership cost of a car boil down to? A Volkswagen Golf costs about $40,000 over a five-year period considering all the associated costs compared to the cash price of $32,862. However, it's not necessary to spend that much. You could opt for a used car like this 2017 Golf with just 42,000 miles on it for $16,000. That's a 51% discount versus the cash price for the new car. The depreciation trend is the same here in the UK. So you can find similarly good deals here as well. Now, there are a couple of other tricks you can use to save money when buying a car. Starting with skipping the car. If you're lucky to live where transportation is easy, skip the car altogether. This is not for everyone, but a lot of my friends and colleagues don't have cars at all. They live in city centers and use the tube or cycle to get around the city. I do the same for my office commute. It's faster and costs me half as much if I was to drive and park near the office. Second, time your purchase. Dealers often have quarterly sales target to meet. Try purchasing around this time to potentially get better deals. Third, buy privately. Dealers typically mark up car prices. Buying from a private seller could save you a lot more, but remember, always bring along a knowledgeable friend and get the car properly inspected before you make the purchase. Four, test drive. If a car catches your eye and you're really interested, take it for a spin. Don't just stick to the smooth highways, test it on different road types to make sure it performs well all around. Number five, negotiate. Always, always negotiate the price. Dealers and sellers expect it. And if the price is too high, don't be afraid to walk away. There's always another car out there that fits your budget. So if buying your first car or upgrading to a different one is something you're planning to do, then you might want to watch this video where I talk about five proven strategies to work less and make more money.